This sphere might be the most dangerous object on Earth. Its power is enough to wipe out an entire city, and yet it's small enough to fit in one hand. It's called the Demon Core. It was meant to be the heart of a third nuclear bomb if Japan had not surrendered after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Even in its dormant state, it claimed the lives of two grown men in the most excruciating way imaginable. What's even more unsettling is how their deaths seem strangely connected in the most bizarre way. But in order to fully grasp how eerily connected they are, we need to first talk about the accidents. Just about a week after Japan announced its intention to surrender, Harry Doglian and his colleagues were working with the Third Plutonium Core. Their experiments aimed to refine control over nuclear reactions, ensure the bomb's reliability, and prevent future accidents by pushing the core as close to the edge as possible without crossing the dangerous threshold. Doglian and his colleagues managed to carefully approach the edge but always stopped before it became too risky. After a long day in the lab, Doglian had dinner with his colleagues, but he just couldn't stop thinking about the core. While his colleagues went home for the night, Doglian returned to the lab alone, fully aware that he was violating safety protocols, which required at least one other person to be present. With only a guard stationed outside the room, Doglian resumed his experiment, determined to make further progress on the core. There's a famous quote by Richard Feynman warning about the dangers of such experiments, comparing them to tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. Yet, it's apparent how much this warning was ignored, as the core was even playfully named Rufus. Before we can comprehend what happened during the accidents, we need to understand the difference between the explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and what was happening in the lab. The two nuclear bombs dropped on Japan relied on compressing conventional explosives to create the devastating explosions we know. But in this experiment, none of that was involved. They were working directly with the core itself. Even without the use of traditional explosives, the core was still capable of unleashing deadly radiation when pushed into a state known as criticality. In this state, the core triggers a self-sustaining chain reaction, where atoms split rapidly, releasing lethal amounts of energy and radiation. This is exactly what Doglian and his colleagues were testing, pushing the core as close to criticality as possible and carefully stacking tungsten carbide bricks around it. These bricks reflected neutrons back into the core, speeding up the reaction, all the while they tried to avoid crossing the line into disaster. Unfortunately, due to poor handling and total disregard for safety precautions, a criticality accident became a very real possibility. As Doglian continued stacking the tungsten carbide bricks around the plutonium core, the neutron counter suddenly spiked, signaling that the core was dangerously close to criticality. Reacting quickly, he began disassembling the bricks, removing them one by one. But in a moment of misfortune, he accidentally dropped one of the bricks directly onto the core, awakening the sleeping dragon. A bright blue flash and a wave of heat filled the dimly lit lab, triggering a burst of deadly radiation. Doglian quickly knocked the brick off, plunging the lab back into darkness. Despite his rapid response, the split-second radiation exposure was enough to seal his fate. He had received a bath of neutrons and gamma rays more intense than any civilian had ever suffered, more even than the unfortunate victims of Nagasaki. In the weeks that followed, he suffered a slow and painful death, beginning from intense nausea, pain, and weakness, to his hand swelling as the skin blistered and peeled away, and the organs of his body slowly began to shut down. In just 25 days, he passed away at the age of 24, after falling into a coma. Despite receiving intensive medical care, there was little that could be done. The dragon had devoured its first victim. While the exact amount of radiation Harry Doglian was exposed to is unknown, modern estimates suggest he received approximately 510 ram, more than enough to kill a man. But this was nothing compared to the second accident. Modern estimates believe he received between 1,000 and 2,100 ram, claiming his life in just nine excruciating days.
What makes the next accident even more tragic is that Louis Lawton was the man who stayed by Harry Duglian's side the most in his final days. Duglian's death left a deep scar on him. Not only were they close friends and colleagues, but Slotin had been his mentor and lab supervisor. Slotin had also played a key role in assembling the Trinity device, the world's first nuclear bomb, which killed hundreds and thousands in Japan. This left him deeply shaken by the toll of his work, and now, with the death of his friend, Slotin grew increasingly disillusioned with the continuation of the nuclear weapons program. He planned to leave the world of nuclear physics behind and return to teaching. But before he could walk away for good, there was one final task he needed to complete. Slotin was the only one qualified to demonstrate how to handle the core and others depended on his knowledge. And so, despite his desire to leave, Slotin found himself drawn back to the core, as if the dragon had been patiently waiting for him all along. Only after his death, the death of their senior physicist, did the government finally ban any form of hands-on experiment. Louis Slotin was an exceptional physicist, exceptional even from a young age. At just 16, he entered the University of Manitoba to pursue a degree in science. He earned gold medal in both physics and chemistry and graduated with a bachelor's degree in geology in 1932, followed by a master's degree a year later. Slotin then obtained a fellowship to study at King's College London, and it was there that his thrill-seeking attitude became apparent. He boxed, and according to Robert Junke, in his book, Brighter Than a Thousand Suns, Slotin even volunteered for service in the Spanish Civil War purely for the thrill of it. His boldness also set him apart in his work. He was the only one brave enough to repair and install instruments inside the Clinton Pile reactor six feet underwater while it was still operating, rather than wait an extra day for the reactor to be shut down. This fearlessness, however, would eventually backfire in the worst way possible. Louis Lawton was performing a demonstration in front of seven other physicists, including his replacement, Alban Graves. The experiment involved the same plutonium core that killed his friend. The core was nestled in an upward-facing hemisphere of beryllium. Using his left hand, Slotin manually lowered another beryllium hemisphere over the core, with his thumb inserted through a hole at the top. To maintain a narrow gap between the two hemispheres, he wedged a screwdriver between them with his right hand. The purpose of this experiment was the same as Douglian's. By bringing the beryllium hemisphere closer together, the neutrons would reflect back into the core, pushing it toward criticality. It's important to note that Slotin had removed the shims that normally kept the two hemispheres from fully closing, giving him finer control over the reaction. Slotin had performed this delicate maneuver successfully many times before, which makes the fatal outcome even more unnerving. Enrico Fermi had reportedly warned Slotin and others that they would be dead within a year if they continued with these risky experiments, but once again, they ignored his warning. Everyone in the room was confident that Slotin would pull it off. He was, after all, the expert. As Slotin began his demonstration, bringing the beryllium hemispheres closer together at exactly 3.20 p.m., the unthinkable happened. The screwdriver slipped, and the upper hemisphere fell, causing a prompt critical reaction and unleashing a burst of hard radiation. A sudden blue glow and heat wave instantly enveloped the room. Slotin immediately felt a sour taste in his mouth and a searing pain in his left hand. The dragon was once again awakened from its slumber. He quickly yanked the hemisphere away to stop the chain reaction, but it was already too late. That does it, he said, glancing down at his hands. To the others, he seemed no different than he had moments before, but Slotin knew he was a dead man walking. At the time of the accident, the dosimetry badges were about a hundred feet away from where the reaction occurred. Realizing that no one in the room had their film badges on, immediately after the accident, Slotin asked Schreiber to retrieve the badges from the lead box and place them on the critical assembly. This peculiar request offered no value in determining the actual doses received by the man in the room and put Schreiber at great personal risk of additional exposure. 
A later report concluded that a heavy dose of radiation could cause vertigo, leaving a person in no condition for rational behavior. As soon as Slotin left the building, he vomited, a common and immediate reaction to severe ionizing radiation exposure. His colleagues rushed him to the hospital, but the damage was already irreversible. Despite intensive medical care and offers from numerous volunteers to donate blood for transfusion, Slotin's condition was terminal. He called his parents, who were flown in at army expense from Winnipeg to be with him. They arrived on the fourth day after the incident when Slotin was still in good spirits and sitting up in bed. But by the fifth day, his condition deteriorated rapidly. Over the next four days, Slotin endured an agonizing series of radiation-induced traumas, including severe diarrhea, reduced urine output, swollen hands, erythema, massive blisters on his hands and forearms, intestinal paralysis, and gangrene. He suffered from internal radiation burns throughout his body, which one medical expert described as a three-dimensional sunburn. By the seventh day, he began experiencing periods of mental confusion. His lips turned blue and he was placed in an oxygen tent. As his body began to shut down, Slotin experienced a total disintegration of bodily function and eventually slipped into a coma. He died at 11 a.m. on May 30th with his parents by his side. Now, this is where things become spooky. Even though the accidents occurred several months apart and Slotin was well aware of the dangers of handling the same deadly core that had claimed his friend's life, and yet, as if it were orchestrated in some morbid way, both accidents took place on a Tuesday, on the 21st of the month, where they both died in the same exact hospital, in the same exact room, under the care of the same nurse. The chilling coincidences were enough to spook the researchers at Los Alamos, attributing it to something far more sinister at play. And that's how they came up with the name The Demon Corps. The aftermath also shook the US government, prompting a ban on any future hands-on criticality experiments. From that point forward, all experiments involving the Corps had to be conducted from a safe distance, using remote controls and safety equipment. And since then, no accidents like those involving Daglian and Slotin have ever occurred. And as for the fate of the core, originally, researchers at Los Alamos had lots of plans for it, but eventually, they were all cancelled. In the end, it was melted down and recycled. 